Uh, I'm just going to set over the agenda. So uh, we'll first do some introductions with the presenters and our moderator for today. Uh, and then we're going to explore uh, the, the following topics in the, today's webinar. So we're going to look at the current landscape for clinical trials in gene, uh, in gene therapy for CNS diseases. We will also have a look at a snapshot of the current imaging biomarkers in gene therapy drug development, uh, an overview of the challenges in designing and conducting gene therapy trials and the roles that uh, imaging will play to address some of those challenges. And of course, uh, if you've got any questions, we'll address them in the second half of the webinar. Um, so yes, uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the presenters uh, for today's webinar. So um, we have Adam Schwartz coming in from uh, Takeda uh, as a head of clinical imaging. Uh, we have uh, Kersey Kinnunen, um, senior biomarker scientist at Ixico, and the moderator for today, Igor uh, Avdiev, uh, director of project management at Ixico. So um, Adam's background is, is that he has been following training in physics and engineering and has worked uh, in medical imaging for 25 years as an imaging and biomarker specialist in pharma. Um, this has included working with the likes of GSK, Eli Lilly and Takeda, where he currently serves as a head of clinical imaging, overseeing clinical imaging activities across all of Takeda's therapeutic areas. Uh, Kersey joins uh, uh, is a senior biomarker scientist and a chartered psychologist of 15 years of clinical neuroscience research experience. Her focus is on brain imaging uh, in CNS clinical trials with expertise across Hunt, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's, uh, and many other uh, therapeutic indications. Uh, she'll, she provides science input and imaging planning help for biotechs during development and maintenance stages of gene therapy trials. Uh, and Igor is the Director of Project Management here at Ixico with over 10 years of global project management experience working in clinical development. And he's got a breadth of experience in leading projects at an interse intersection of technology, regulations and clinical development. Um, and uh, he's worked on a number of different uh, uh, disease indications, uh, especially in gene therapies for CNS diseases. So uh, that's our presenters and moderators for today. So before we go ahead, um, uh, I'd like to run a poll just to see um, what people's thoughts are. Um, and uh, the first poll that we're going to run is, so where do you see the greatest added value for imaging in CNS gene therapy trials, assuming that the you know, imaging, uh, imaging method is available? And then just please select the ones that are available uh, that are the most uh, applicable to this answer for you. Uh, this poll will run for 30 seconds. So get your questions in. And we're closing it in five, four, three, two, one. Brilliant, I'm gonna share that information now. And what we see here is there's an even split across the patient selection, biodistribution, proximal pharmacodynamic, pharmacodynamics, Distal pharmacodynamics and neurodegeneration and uh, safety monitoring. I think safety monitoring obviously seems to be uh, the most uh, prominent of the responses. So, um, and then the second question that we're going to actually uh, fire up uh, again, this will last about 30 seconds. Um, this will be where do you see the greatest unmet need uh, for imaging methods in CNS uh, gene therapy trials? Select all that's applicable. Again, similar numbers, uh, similar uh, questions. Um, this uh, poll will run for 30 seconds. And just looking at the numbers now, we're really looking at distal pharmacodynamics and neurodegenerative. Uh, I'm going to see if I can just extend that before. Yeah, neurodegeneration. Cool. And we're closing off the poll now and sharing the results. So as you can see, again, I think proximal pharmacodynamics is the most prominent of responses here, where we think that there's a greatest unmet need uh, for imaging methods in CNS gene therapy trials. So um, that's super insightful. And I think that's going to be helpful for how uh, Adam's going to angle his presentation. So I think without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first uh, presenter for today, Adam, and um, over to you uh, for uh, the, the webinar. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? We can do indeed. Okay, can I share my screen and do I have control? Should be able to now. Okay. 
Yep, we can see it crystal clear. Very good. Now let me just do the audience view so I know what you're seeing. Presenter mode. Of course, the obligatory swapping of. Okay, very good. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I'm going to kick things off today by providing a perspective from the, the pharma side on roles of neuroimaging in gene therapy for the CNS. I thought I'd start off with a, a bit of a, a snapshot of the current landscape of what's actually uh, currently happening in terms of clinical trials in this space. Um, and so if we start on the left, we can see that um, if we do a, a search on clinicaltrials.gov, we can see that there's actually quite a, quite a number of, um, of diseases that are currently being uh, investigated with gene therapy uh, uh, trials. Um, the, the search actually threw up um, a total of 29 trials, but these are spread across 17 different diseases. And you'll see that many of these are, are rare genetic disorders. Um, and also something else that became apparent on, uh, on looking at these results is that many of these, is, there's only one trial currently ongoing, and perhaps that says something about the uh, uh, the nature of the, the competition and the rarity of the disease in this space and, and the, the business um, the business landscape is a little bit different than in uh, rare uh, than in more common sporadic disorders where um, there's perhaps uh, you know, there are more patients to go around um, one thing that emerged here is that although um, a number of these diseases do have a CNS component uh, a number of the the trials and the therapies um, for many of these, we're actually addressing uh, peripheral manifestations of the disease. And so those I've, I've colored in blue here in all of these graphs, um, whereas those I've colored in red are those that are perhaps a bit more relevant for today's discussion, those that are more CNS specific and for which the trials were more explicitly targeting CNS uh, manifestations of the disease. And we can see how these, these findings kind of illustrate some of the uh, some of the aspects, some of the characteristics of uh, clinical trials in this space that are, are very relevant for how uh, imaging may or may not fit in, where it may have a, a role to play, where it might be challenged. And one of these is route of administration. And we can see that if the peripheral uh, manifestations are of primary interest, intravenous route of administration is, is fairly popular. But if um, the CNS is the primary target, then at least in terms of the trials that are currently ongoing, uh, more invasive methods are, are preferred, uh, explicitly intracisternal or intracerebral routes of administration. Other aspects of um, clinical trials in these uh, gene therapy space is the trial design. Very often, these trials are open label, meaning there's no control arm which is a bit of a departure from the more standard uh, randomized clinical trial design that we're familiar with from the more, uh, the more common sporadic diseases. Another, another feature of uh, trials in, in this space is the sample size. You can see that almost all of these, uh, these trials that came up in this, in this survey uh, were targeting uh, complete enrollment of fewer than 20, 20 subjects, which is, probably an order of magnitude lower than what one would expect from a phase two or phase three regulator facing trial in the case of more sporadic diseases. And then finally, we get a, we get a start to get a notion of how people are currently using imaging in this space, but probably the take home message from this, this last graph is that for, um, for therapeutics targeting the CNS specifically, there's basically a, a a much, uh, a much greater use of imaging in general than in those that are targeting the periphery. So we can be maybe a bit more structured about thinking about the roles of imaging biomarkers in, in this space. So this, this graphic is, is a general one about uh, the roles and the contexts of use of imaging in drug development generally. And what I thought would be useful is if we actually just kind of walk through this and maybe a, uh, a hypothetical example. So I've sort of uh, I'll be discussing a, a trial in Huntington's disease um, using intracerebral administration. So this is this is hypothetical, but it is drawing on some of the things that are currently done in clinical trial practice at this point in time. 
Uh, and one of the things that comes up if you are doing an intracerebral administration, that is a, a, an infusion of the investigational product directly into the brain parenchyma, is that that is, um, that is by, by construction uh, a neurosurgical operation. And so there's an additional role for imaging and specifically uh, MRI in most cases in surgical planning uh, and potentially in monitoring of the surgery, uh, surgical procedure as well, depending on the, the way in which the, um, um, the procedure takes place. Um, and so this is a, a very important role for, for MRI in the case of anything that is um, uh, involves the surgical component. Another, um, uh, another aspect of imaging that sort of is, is sort of a consequence of this is that in some trials in Huntington's disease, uh, volumetric MRI is actually used as, a, as an inclusion criterion uh, at screening. And the reason for this is that the chordate and putamen, which are uh, the brain regions that are most substantially atrophied, in Huntington's disease, and those are usually the targets of the gene therapy, um, there's a problem if those are so, uh, so extremely atrophied that they are too small to safely and reliably target using the, um, the surgical procedure. And so some trials put a lower bound on the volume of uh, the good and putamen as an inclusion criterion into the, um, into the, into the trial. A biodistribution, uh, in general, these days as the field uh, pivots away somewhat from small molecules, biodistribution is playing an, uh, an increasing role and there are opportunities there for imaging. In this particular example, um, what is typically done is to uh, mix uh, an, a gadolinium contrast agent in with the investigational product. So after injecting the infusate into the brain, you can see in this image here, that you get a very nice high contrast image of where exactly it was injected. So that's useful for visualization and qualitative interpretation by, um, by the surgeon, for example, but also one can quantify that using image processing and get an actual number on how much, what fraction of the target structure was actually covered by, by the infusion procedure. Safety monitoring. MRI is very well established in, um, in neurology trials generally for monitoring safety, and that's, that's equally the case here in this example, although, again, the intracerebral administration um, would require additional safety monitoring around the, the surgical procedure itself. But for the next, uh, next five minutes or so, I'd like to explore this, um, this sort of axis here, this diagonal axis in the diagram, which is really all around pharmacodynamic biomarkers. So these are biomarkers designed to pick up uh, intended, hypothesized, what we expect to be, in some sense, beneficial effects of the treatment, as opposed to safety, which is really where you're trying to, where you're going to pick up something that you hope not to see. In this case, these are changes that we do want to see. And, and the, the difference here along these, these, three, um, these three pieces of terminology, which is really a little, a little arbitrary, but basically it, it covers um, aspects of the biology that are very proximal to the, um, to the treatment mechanism down at the target engagement end of the spectrum. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got imaging biomarkers that are more reflecting the disease and less specific to a given intervention. And so in this particular example, in this context, Huntington's disease uh, gene therapy, there are actually a number of imaging biomarkers that, um, that are being used to pick up this downstream um, neurodegeneration, where essentially one is hoping to um, slow down what is an accelerated uh, worsening in the, in the disease, uh, in, the, in the presence of the disease. And so we have things like MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Interestingly, it's not widely used in neurology trials generally, but it does crop up here, where the, the NAA signal uh, essentially provides a proxy for viable neurons in the in the target region. FDG PET is used to uh, to quantify cerebral glucose metabolism, but probably the most widely used is volumetric MRI. Uh, in the case of Huntington's disease, we're fortunate in that there's a very rich set of natural history data, and that's often the case with volumetric MRI. Um, for most diseases, if there's going to be a decent data set available. In the absence of treatment, it's probably going to be with MRI. But um, so, you know, one has a good idea of how well powered 
one is in terms of being able to pick up a treatment effect. Um, but one of the problems with volumetric MRI is it's, it's more downstream uh, still than things like MRS or FDG PET. And so there is the possibility of, of confounds uh, potentially impacting uh, the interpretation of a, a change in volume as a, a biomarker of neurodegeneration, especially in the case of a very interventional approach such as we have here, where the actual target structure itself is being physically impacted by the procedure. The other end of the spectrum is where I want to speak for the next uh, for the next few minutes, and and for me this is where there's a bit of a gap currently in the field, not specific to Huntington's disease, and the the notion here is if one, if one has an imaging biomarker that is reflecting um, a biological change that's very proximal to the mechanism of action, then we're going to be much better placed to pick up a, a signal a, a, a strong signal size that is amenable to um, being detected in a small in a small sample size, which is one of the kind of overriding challenges of gene therapy trials. So we can be a bit more formal on this slide of, of what I'm talking about here. And this is really the notion of that um, the biological pathways downstream from the gene expression that's being targeted provide very, uh, very concrete um, potential targets for imaging biomarkers that can uh, can reflect these very proximal pharmacodynamic effects of the treatment. Um, we expect that a gene uh, that a, a change in gene expression following treatment should result in fairly rapid and um, detectable changes in the expressed level of the expressed protein, and potentially the substrate on which that that protein or enzyme acts as well. That may have um, important uh, interpretation in terms of toxicity of the disease, for example. So there are some examples here for a number of diseases. These targets are very well, um, well characterized. Uh, unfortunately, for most of them, the imaging biomarkers uh, don't exist, with the possible exception of carbon-13 spectroscopy, which could be used to uh, measure glycogen levels in the case of Pompeii disease. But in, in many cases, these, these, these remain a gap in the field and a potential opportunity and the one exception actually is Parkinson's disease, which I'd like to illustrate on the following slide. And I think for me, this is really, really the poster child of where there is a potential value add um, for drug development and uh, biomarkers of this, of this type. And the notion here is that in Parkinson's disease, the dopamine synthesis pathway is impaired. This is the conversion of L-dopa into dopamine. And this is achieved through um, the AADC enzyme which is encoded by the AADC gene. And so there have been a number of gene therapy trials that have, that have targeted this, this process directly um, with the notion that the gene therapy would increase the levels of the AADC enzyme, which would increase the synthesis rate, increase the levels of dopamine. We're fortunate from an imaging perspective in that we have uh, available to us a couple of PET traces that have actually been around for for a few decades, F-DOPA and FMT, these are basically radio-labeled analogs of, um, of L-DOPA. And so the uptake of these, these ligands can be interrogated to uh, provide basically a molecular imaging biomarker of the AADC enzyme activity, which is the very proximal target of this therapeutic intervention. And for me, the money shot is this, this graph in the top right-hand corner here. This is from a, a few years ago now from a gene therapy trial, AEDC gene therapy trial, showing uh, after, after therapy at, at uh, uh, time zero, you can see in essentially every single patient a very clear, rapid uptake, uh, increase in uptake of FMT. And if we interpret this as a, as a marker of enzyme activity, then the enzyme activity, as hypothesized, is increased um, in a way that is easily detectable in the absence of a control arm and in a, in a very short period of time. And moreover, this increased activity is actually sustained for several years after the therapy. And one can even discern here uh, something of a dose response. Um, the blue and the red are just different dose levels here. There's no control arm. So this, I hope, is a very convincing example of uh, the potential utility of detecting in a very short space of time uh, a successful treatment intervention, at least mechanistically, um, without having to wait many, many years to pick up um, maybe more downstream events. And the bottom panel here is uh, just from a separate report of a um, 
of a similar approach, in this case using FDOPA. In this case, the, um, the, the authors have very nicely linked the, the increase in uh, AADC activity using FDOPA PET to the actual biodistribution, to the percent coverage of the curtailment using the gadolinium MRI that we, we talked about a few minutes ago. So this is ex exemplary, I think, of, of the opportunity here um, for biomarkers of this type. As mentioned, in many cases, this remains a gap and uh, possibly in the Q&A, if people are interested, we could, um, we could discuss why the, some of the reasons why those gaps may still, may still be existing. So just finally, I'd like to spend a, a couple of minutes talking about uh, opportunities for translation from uh, preclinical to clinical. The first point I want to make here is actually uh, quite a general one. In general, if we're um, thinking about how to plan uh, the use of imaging in, in clinical development and how that uh, imaging might be maximally leveraged to really add value and to impact decision making, um, non-clinical experiments can be really, really important to help, um, help distinguish which of the biomarkers may, may provide the biggest signal and what type of signal change we might, have, we might expect. For example, are we, are we reasonably expecting a reversal of some disease effect or are we just expecting something to get worse at a slower rate? That has a big, a big impact in terms of the statistical power, for example. So preclinical experiments are really important to demonstrate that the effect, uh, the biological effect is detectable using the, the imaging method specifically and that we have reason to believe not only in the therapy but in the actual biomarker. And so this, this top right uh, panel just uh, illustrates one nice example in the case of Huntington's, uh, a mouse model uh, effects here on PDE10, PDE10 PET. The second point I want to make about preclinical is really around biodistribution. This is more, perhaps a bit more specific to gene therapy, where there is a real role, in my opinion, to, uh, to use imaging to help optimize the drug delivery paradigm before a translation into, into humans, where you maybe don't want to be playing around with these variables at that point, you want to have made a decision. This example here in the bottom panel is a very nice example of gadolinium MRI showing very focal biodistribution in the putamen here in this experiment. And what's interesting here is that this is not a centrally administered paradigm. This is actually a systemic administration. And these, these authors have used focused ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier in a very focal way around the putamen in this case. And also, another approach that can be used is the use of PET imaging to a whole body biodistribution. In this example, the authors have used iodine labeled AEV capsids and directly compared intravenous and intracisternal administration. In the absence of anything clever like uh, focused ultrasound, these, uh, these results uh, show a very nice quantification of a, a dramatically increased exposure of the central compartment when using intracisternal versus intravenous administration. And so just finally, my last slide here is just to summarize some of the challenges and opportunities that I've, uh, I've been discussing for imaging in the context of gene therapy of the CNS. As mentioned, the small sample size and the lack of control arm um, provides challenges from a, a statistical perspective. Um, there's often a lack of natural history data. This is a bit spotty, actually. Some, some diseases such as Huntington's and to some extent now Friedrich's ataxia, there is a concerted effort to build up a, a database of natural history data, but it's not always the case in some diseases. And for certain imaging approaches, for example, some of the more novel molecular imaging approaches, it's unlikely that there's a, a, a database of historic controls. As mentioned, um, some Downstream outcomes such as brain structure, uh, there are one has to be aware of potential confounds there that are maybe not uh, related to neurodegeneration, but other factors that may be confounding those outcomes. And then we have some opportunities, as mentioned, biodistribution has a big role. Um, uh, proximal PD molecular imaging biomarkers, in my opinion, if and when they can be developed, uh, provide a very very concrete uh, and, and clear signal in the case of uh, small n trials, which is what we're dealing with here. And the Parkinson's example provides a, uh, a window on what that might look like. And just finally, I don't have time to talk about it in detail, but we could potentially come back to it in the Q&A if people are interested. 
is um, this notion of accelerated approval and reasonably likely surrogate endpoints and, and what, what some of the uh, opportunities and challenges might be for that in the case of imaging and gene therapy as well. And so those were the points I wanted to make. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. With that, I'll pass the, uh, pass the ball back to Jane A and Kersey. Thank you, Adam. That was super insightful. And I think it's really just highlighted what the unmet needs are, but also like the, the really exciting opportunity that we could do uh, to identify imaging biomarkers and really capitalize on understanding disease progression and drug efficacy. So um, before we go ahead with uh, Kersey's presentation, what I do want to do is just revisit the polls again. Now that you've seen for Adam's presentation, I just want to ask the question once more and see uh, if the opinions have changed since then. So it's going to be a short 30 second poll. Uh, starting off with where do you see the um, <clears throat> the greatest added value for imaging in CNS gene therapy trials is. Um, we're going to run this for 30 seconds. Uh, let's see what you think and if your opinion has changed since seeing Adam's presentation. Uh, automatically, you can see that now people are thinking, oh yeah, biodistribution is something that we need to be more considerate about. Um, but again, I think it's, it's, it's still quite uh, evenly spread. Uh, we're going to close this poll in about five seconds. Three, two, and we're closing. Good. So I'm just going to share the results. Uh, again, very even split. So I guess like, you know, this is very holistic. It's a, it's a good understanding. It's a good uh, spread of uh, what we are considering at the moment in terms of what's added value. So again, the question, gonna... which would be what is the biggest challenges that you, uh, biggest challenge when setting up neuro, um, setting up and managing neuromaging uh, studies. So this is going to be the precursor to Kersey's uh, uh, presentation. So uh, it'd be great to know your thoughts. Um, Again, multiple question, uh, multiple answers. So let us know what you think um, prior to the um, uh, prior to Kirsty's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we'll share the responses, and this uh, poll will close in the next uh, in 15 seconds. So get your answers in. You can see straight away that we're really looking at the, the challenges, really finding and selecting uh, and getting those imaging sites uh, and getting them qualified. So uh, we're going to close it in three, two. One and I'm going to share the results now. So great, yep. Yeah, again, you know, it's it feels like uh, between finding and selecting the imaging sites and getting them qualified versus choosing the right imaging endpoints is often the challenge. And I think it does speak to the unmet needs and the opportunities that Adam sort of presented earlier on. So I think without further ado, I'm now just going to pass over to Kersey, who's going to talk to these challenges in much more detail and how we. Um, how to set yourself up, uh, what the roles in neuroimaging are going to be. So, Kersey, over to you. Yep. Thank you, Tene. So, should should be able to see my screen now. We can do. Yep, we can yep, do. That's great. Um, yeah, so I'll just start my slideshow and yeah, and based great. on the Poll results that we just saw. Um, I think I think you you will be glad to see that I'm first talking about those challenges. Um, so here's my outline. So we'll start with the how to select and qualify the right imaging sites. Then I'll provide an example of a gene therapy trial. And then we go through the safety follow-up and potential efficacy endpoints and the imaging sequences or types of PET imaging you could use for those. Um, and finally, some of the additional imaging requirements that have to do with intracerebral GD trials. So. First, um, a little bit about um, selecting and qualifying the imaging sites. So I'm coming to this from the imaging CRO point of view, and um, we we help with this selecting and qualifying imaging sites all, all the time, and and that's really to ensure that both the site and the scanner meet the requirements of the study, and also then that way we can ensure that the imaging data will be of suitable quality for any analysis. And 
uh, one of those aspects with qualifying the site is to ensure that the site staff are trained um, for all the imaging activities in that study and also how to transfer the data to the imaging CRO. Um, and in terms of the requirements, there are many, I'm just listing a few here, um, but typical considerations at that stage are just to choose which scanner manufacturers to use or is there a need to limit it to, to just one manufacturer for some reason? Um, um, are any particular scanner models more desirable than others or could some of them not even be used for all of those imaging sequences required? Um, the availability of those sequences in product mode um, for intracerebral GD trials. Um, there's also the need to consider the site's um, intraoperative MRI capability and whether they have the equipment that are compatible with systems for IMRI and stereotactic procedures. Um, and then there are other requirements like, like the head coil that's needed for some advanced imaging if that's used in the study. Um, and then we go to the example put together for a GT trial that includes neurosurgery, so intracerebral administration and five years of safety follow-up. It could look something like this. So you can already see how many roles imaging has in a trial like this. So as Adam mentioned, um, for screening, we might need to check that the target region has enough volume. So that would be part of the eligibility. Um, then there's a radiological read normally to screen out those participants that are not suitable. Um, and then when we come to baseline, that's baseline for any efficacy analysis. So we need to do imaging again. Then because this trial would have neurosurgery, there would be a need to do preoperative MRI to plan the trajectories. Um, and this could be done as part of the screening or as part of the baseline imaging, or even both if there's a long gap between the screening and baseline. And then it's done again just before the treatment. So the intraoperative visit also includes some of the planning. Um, and then there are many visits for safety follow-up usually in a trial like this, um, especially during the first year, there, there could be more frequent visits. Um, efficacy follow-up, uh, there's not necessarily a need to do efficacy follow-up at all those same visits as the safety follow-up. For example, it can start later on, or for some of the sequences, there could be an interest to collect the data even at the early post-operative visits, but not for others. Because for example, for volumetric MRI, the regions that have been targeted might still be too affected to, to do reliable volumetric analysis at very early on after the surgery. But for something like diffusion MRI, it might be interesting to see what happens early on. Um, and if the, if the trial doesn't include neurosurgery, then those visits, especially in the first year, probably don't need to be as frequent. And certainly from, from two years onwards, they could be annual visits, wouldn't need to be every six months necessarily. But this is, this is just an example of what that kind of a trial could look like. Um, then um, considering safety follow-up. So radiological reads have the major role here and we need to make sure that we collect the right data so that the radiologists can find the right signs on those images that they are looking at. Um, and really this, this image here that shows the T2 weighted image flare and uh, diffusion weighted image and the apparent diffusion coefficient map is just there to, to show you how it's good to have several different sequences 
when you find something on, for example, the situated image, then you can check if, if there's a corresponding finding on the flare. And then if you want to see whether that's potentially um, edema, vasogenic edema or cytotoxic edema, then you could evaluate the diffusion weighted image as well as the ADC map. Um, in, in these uh, neurosurgery trials, there could be a requirement to do an early safety checkup. So that could be even a day one scan, could be a day seven scan or day 14 scan. And because it would be such an early time point, that could be used as an additional reference time point so that, that you could then see what the brain looked like soon after the surgery and then compare a later follow-up imaging to that. Um, and yeah, and um, in, in addition, the intra, if there's intraoperative MRI used, then scans acquired during the operation can also be used as an additional reference time point for the safety MRI checks. Um, then, Moving on to efficacy imaging, um, volumetric imaging really has broad application across different therapeutic areas where gene therapy trials are either ongoing at the moment or are being planned. Um, so I don't need to say too much about this, I don't think. Um, just highlighted some of the regions of interest, both uh, potentially as a target and then for efficacy analysis for longitudinal imaging. Um, diffusion MRI is another interesting technique, um, especially when you apply free water imaging to the diffusion data, because then you can look at free water separately from the restricted water. So that, that could have some implications, again, for evaluating edema, uh, neuroinflammation, it could reflect those, those uh, signs that you also would see on the safety MRI data. So potentially even looking at safety MRI data and free water imaging together uh, might be valuable. Otherwise, diffusion MRI can be used for efficacy endpoints. It can be region-based or white matter tract-based or also structural connectivity based. So all of these analyses can be conducted if the right kind of diffusion data have been collected. Then we have um, uh, MRS. MRS um, has been used in HD, for example. Um, in Huntington's disease, um, we see a reduction in the DNAA and we see an increase in myoinositol that has been shown in, in several papers. Um, so that, that could be something to consider if um, metabolism is of interest. Um, there are now different techniques as well for acquiring MRS data. Um, it's not only press, press now, there's also techniques like semi-laser um, that could potentially have a um, better application for multicenter studies. Um, one complexity about MRS is the consistent placement of the, of the MRS voxel across time points. So usually it should be done according to the baseline. Um, so you can see here in this example, it's actually being consistently placed over the left putamen at baseline and follow-up, which means we'll then have more reliable data. Um, and the other example there is um, another single voxel MRS study, um, but it's using a PONS voxel. Um, then, as, as Adam mentioned, FDG PET is one of those potentially interesting techniques. Um, if you want to evaluate brain glucose metabolism. Um, this example I have here is from the SIGNAL trial. The SIGNAL trial was not the gene therapy trial, but very interestingly, um, the, the treatment 
treatment for HD that um, the signal trial evaluated appears to have reversed the FDT PET change across many different regions. Um, you can see here the, the mean SUVR change from baseline to month 17. This was in early manifest HD um, and um, the treated group in, in blue um, seems to seems to have reversed the hypometabolism. Um, another another study was a smaller study in pre-manifest HD um, and the participants were grouped according to the CAP score um, and there seems to be a relationship between the striatal hypometabolism and this low and medium and high CAP score groups. So that's something to consider. And then there's um, that spect imaging. That that spect imaging is is well known in Parkinson's disease as a as a screening technique, uh, screening for dopaminergic deficit. Um, it could be used as an enrichment biomarker, or to identify prodromal stage or disease severity. Um, longitudinally. Um, it could give a floor effect over several years. Um, over one year and, and two years, you still see that rate of decline there, but um, by four years, it's, it's at floor. Um, so definitely utility for screening. Um, evident, there is limited evidence of FDT, sorry, not FDT, that spec as a progression marker. Um, but it's it's still a bit mixed, and there we we just have a, an example of a quantitative analysis pipeline that could be used to analyze that spec data. Resting state fMRI is another technique, um, um, and this has utility really across different therapeutic areas. Um, and with this, we can do either a seed-based analysis um, to look at connections between certain regions or certain networks, uh, or we can do um, an independent components analysis and look at the data in a data-driven way without starting from the predefined networks, um, and then can apply graph theory to the data and and then the endpoints would be the graph theory metrics. So there's a lot you can do again with the resting state data as well, um, if functional connectivity is of interest. Finally, um, just a few words about the additional requirements that these intracerebral GT trials have. So there's the preoperative planning and intraoperative MRI. If, if that's used. Um, and intraoperative MRI um, previously needed a sort of a hybrid suit um, that's both the, the imaging facility and the operation theater. Um, and then e either the patient was moved to the scanner or the scanner moved to the patient. Um, but now there are also these systems like the clear point system that that means you can do actual real-time intraoperative MRI. So it's it's looking at the treatment as it's being administered. You can see there I have a couple of images there. Um, this was a study in Parkinson's disease, a gene therapy administration into the putamen and and as as the surgeon is is administering the treatment, they can see how that cannula is advancing, the cannula for the infusion. Also, um, during um, preoperative planning, um, they can adjust, they can adjust the trajectories whilst the patient is in the scanner. And, and all of these systems um, are available at 
even three Tesla. So any of them could be used, but it really it de really depends on um, the sites, um, the availability of the sites um, where you want to run the study. Um, do they have? Do they, for example, have the clear point system? Um, or whether you would need to use a more traditional system where you you do the surgery and then every now and then do scanning. So at the at the beginning, then a few times during, and then at the end of surgery, for example. And that's my part. And I was trying to leave time for the QA. So thank you for listening. And I'll hand over to Tene. Thank you very much, Kirsty. That was really great. And I think I hope that's given uh, our audience a lot of uh, food for thought as to like the approach that they can use for um, neuroimaging in their gene therapy trials and where the opportunities are with more tangibility. So I guess what we'd like to do now is to uh, uh, do one more poll. Uh, and that would be the same poll that we had at the very beginning. And just to see what your thoughts were now that you've seen Kirsty's um, presentation. So I'm just going to launch it now. Um, but after you've seen Kirsty's presentation, do you still hold on to the same opinions uh, that you had previously about having the challenges, uh, the biggest challenges in setting up a neuro uh, and managing neuroimaging studies? Are they still the same as what you uh, answered earlier on? Um, I'll give it another 15 seconds for you to answer your questions um, and then think. Great, good. Give me five more seconds. Great, and we will close it off. Uh, again, now I think that the opinion has slightly changed. Uh, I don't know, one second, I just realized I've been showing the wrong screen. Um, there we go. So <clears throat> yeah, so it's, we're really seeing now that um, choosing the right imaging endpoints has now become the focal point of the post presentation. So I guess that that's pretty, uh, that's encouraging to see that, you know, the, the logistics and the thought burden has now been sort of like, uh, unveiled and now we can really start to think about what what we need to uh, what endpoints we want to look at so great uh, if you have any questions um, start populating them into the, uh, the Q&A box otherwise what I'd like to do is bring back our panelists and our moderator so um, uh, for the Q&A section so without further ado um, I'm going to pass it over to Igor um, and um, you can kick start the, pre the, um, uh, the Q&A section now Thank you very much, Jane, and thank you, Adam and Kirsty. Uh, we already have some questions. Uh, Adam, first one for you. Uh, they would like to add the topic of evaluating volumetric MRI for specific brain ROIs in the face of ongoing inflammatory processes, either due to the disease itself or as a reaction to the gene therapy administration and ways to mitigate. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And that's part of what I was hinting at when I mentioned the confounds. Because one of the, you know, the, what's the word, the sort of the inherent um, pros and cons of volumetric MRI, on one hand, it behaves beautifully in the absence of intervention. And there are lots, generally speaking, lots of data around. So it's very well characterized. But the downside is that it is potentially uh, prone to other biological effects that could give rise to volume changes that make it difficult to interpret. So I think there are two there are two sort of ways I, I would answer that at a, at a sort of the high level. A neurotherapeutics article of a couple of years ago sort of went into some of the ways that in the case of systemic administration, you can at least try and sort of get a, a better sense of whether the pattern of changes you're seeing in terms of if there seems to be a slowing of neurodegeneration or an acceleration, uh, does it seem to be more like a disease-related change or does it, is it some sort of non-specific change? So you can use diffusion, for example. So you can compare what's happening at the microstructural level. Are there any kind of growth changes in ADC that seem to maybe indicate something, uh, you know, a different relationship between volume and microstructure? You can look at the anatomical pattern of change and is that, are there hints there of, uh, general brain-wide changes that might be more suggestive of a inflammatory response as opposed to a more uh, patterned slowing of neurodegeneration. So I laid all those out in that article and, and I 
I still think those are, are kind of very easy things that can be done to help interpret volumetric changes. The problem in gene therapy is, especially if it's an intracerebral administration, is that you have this very focal administration of the product. And so if there is an inflammatory reaction, for example, one could expect that that would be also localized to where the product was uh, was infused, which is also localized to where you, you maybe hope to see a slowing of atrophy. So it is very, very difficult. And given also the, uh, the statistical challenges with small samples, I think this just, for me, it just puts a kind of question marks over how one can interpret polymetrics. Perhaps the best thing you can do, given that these trials often have follow-up that's quite long, several years, is you can see if there's a um, anything that looks like a very obvious acute change, very fast change, it's unlikely to be a, a very rapid uh, slowing down of atrophy. You can sort of compare that to more sort of long-term trends in the data. And the nice example of that, this was not in a gene therapy context, but in the context of Alzheimer's disease was Cyril Sir's uh, work with, with Nick Fox and others on the Merck uh, base inhibitor, Verabasis stat, where they, they showed very nicely there was a very acute change picked up within a, within a few weeks that was distinct from a essentially absence of any long-term change on the trajectory of atrophy. So those are my, my thoughts on that. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. I'm going to continue with the next question. Is the use of DTI to look at changes in gray matter regions becoming more standard in clinical trials to show degenerative changes? DTI changes in white matter are interpreted as changes in myelin breakdown, axonal degeneration, etc. For DTI changes in gray matter, how can we determine if changes are due to alterations in a neuron terminal density, changes in the proliferation in astrocytes, microglia, etc.? Could you please comment on that? Yeah, so the first of all, like, um, is it becoming more common to look at diffusion metrics in gray matter? Um, I haven't noticed any any increase in the trend, but um, usually when we do analysis for um, region-based diffusion, then it does include some gray matter regions as well, or at least those like mixed gray matter, white matter regions, um, deep gray regions, deep gray matter regions. Um, yeah, and in terms of um, how how can we determine what those changes are about, I don't know if Adam has some ideas for that. Yeah, I, I think there are you know some uh, more sophisticated models of uh, analyzing diffusion imaging and interpreting that in terms of different compartments. Typically, those more advanced models need um, multi-shell acquisitions, so it does put extra requirements on the on the imaging side. In the case of gene therapy trials, which may be run as more like valet studies, where you have um, the imaging done at, at high-end sites, and, and the, the patients are, are kind of brought to that to make sure that things are done in a in a standardised, high-quality way, rather than a sort of large global phase three trial, for example. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, so in that context, you, you could potentially do that. Part of the problem with diffusion in, in, in my, my experience is that the actual sensitivity to picking up change is not huge. So you'd need to think very carefully about how much of a, a change in whichever of those compartments are modeled by the, by the diffusion model, um, you, can, you actually can confidently detect as being a, being a change. Um, but with all the limitations of DTI being somewhat indirect, not a direct measure of neuron terminal density, it's not a direct measure of microglial infiltration. Um, we're, you know, we're kind of interpreting this on the base of water motility, basically. Um, with all those caveats, um, I think there is a potential uh, there is a potential value. You just need to bear in mind how sensitive you are to, to picking up changes, and then um, ideally bringing in the biology. And again, there's a role here for perhaps some, some preclinical imaging to where you can really tie 
even with like histology and so forth, high elements of the biology that's being impacted using more specific methods and relating those back to what you're picking up in the in the diffusion imaging. So I think diffusion imaging is very interesting in, the, in this respect, but it's not per se a specific readout of those processes. So it's, it has some intri intrinsic limitations. Thank you very much both for contributing to answering this question. I'm going to move forward. Uh, Adam, uh, one specifically for you, what would be the most appropriate frequency of imaging post-operative evaluation of safety, uh, example given inflammation or biodistribution? Yeah, I think as I mentioned before, one of the key things for me is to have some fairly early time points after, let's say in the, in the few weeks after the administration and then combine those with maybe every few months or whatever going in a more chronic phase. Again, the idea being that in a temporal view can you distinguish what looks like an acute change especially if it is consistent with what you would expect if there were inflammatory changes from a more long-term change which may be more consistent with neurodegeneration so for me i mean the specifics of that maybe kirsty can comment on the timing but being able to distinguish short term versus longer term weeks versus months to years would be key for me yeah i think more frequent in the first year as, as i showed in that example would make sense um and definitely a couple of times close close to the surgery so sometimes it's day one sometimes day seven day 14 and then again month one for example month three um and then less frequently maybe after the first year but still, potentially, every six months, up to two years, just to see how the changes are evolving. Are they still increasing? Are they decreasing? Or are they staying stable? Great, I think, and that should conclude um, the webinar for today as we're out of time. Uh, thank you to Igor uh, for moderating the Q&A section and uh, thank you to Adam and Kirsty for joining us for the webinar. We really appreciate the knowledge and wisdom that you brought into uh, this uh, uh, to do to us and hopefully everybody in the uh, webinar has seen benefit from this and, and can continue to use the knowledge. Um, in